Bang, and we're doing the British Raj and the colonization of India. Uh, how do I fancy? For 6.1, the rationals of imperialism. The propaganda the British used was similar to the white man's burden, where they claimed that they were culturally more advanced technologically. They were there to uh, increase the GDP or lifestyle of the Indian population by building railroad, railroads and general infrastructure. In a note to a British lord and overseer of a province, um, Ram Mohan Roy argued that they actually hadn't lived up to any of the promises they previously made and that the area was suffering as a whole from British rule. In 6.2, um, the idea of state expansion and control regions are illustrated. So in our first map, we have the demonstration of there being limited control over India. They were a mainly free region. Um, so preceding the colonization, uh, they were self-ruled and controlled, usually from different um, regions. So the Europeans felt the need to take over and control this section um, due to their riches and the general idea of the white man's burden, feeling that they were less civil civilized and deserved to be controlled and ruled over. In the 6.2 map, we see the East Indian Company influence as it was originally established to exploit the trade between the Indian regions and other places around the world. Um, eventually, it became so influential that the economic systems caused many ind independent Indian regions to be extremely dependent on the company. Um, in the 6.2 map, we can see how the crown eventually completely took over the Indian region. Um, the East India Company fully seized control after a lot of Indian rebellions in 1873 and continued to lose control um, as Queen Victoria took over the majority of the Indian colonies. Okay, for 6.3, we discussed the indigenous responses to state expansion from the period 1750 to 1900. So initially, um, the imperialism begins with the East India Company because that relationship um, expands uh, further British and India, their um, relationship, their trade relationship, and the East India Company eventually um, is monopolized by Britain um, because they raised enough money to carry out this monopoly. Um, and that also granted them trade um, east of the Cape, the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and that was put forth by William III and Mary II. They basically had a full patent on this company granting them basically all of India's uh, economy. So tensions also arise uh, between the British and Indians, of course, because basically um, India's economy had just been taken over fully um, and they no longer had uh, like rule over themselves. They couldn't govern themselves. Everything had just been controlled by their uh, Britain's uh, dictatorship. So the effects of the British Raj, um, so Britain moved in and this occurred during a bad time for India because they were in a recent famine and um, they basically didn't have many shelters, they didn't have much food, they were going through a really bad period and Britain had a lot of money. So they came in and they, they offered them certain things. They put them in these districts um, and they united their provinces, but they made them subordinate 
and uh, yeah, they supported them for a bit, but it, they didn't appreciate that. Um, the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857 was um, a rebellion uh, by a man named Gandhi. So he led uh, a lot of his followers to rebel, um, but that that was failed. Um, and ultimately, uh, some people died. Um, India is well known as as Britain's most beneficial colony for much of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, at this time, India's economy was largely based on agriculture, and cotton was pretty much the most valuable resource. Um, the British connection with India started in 1600 with the creation of a monopoly trading company, the East India Company. For the first century and a half, it operated around the Indian coast from bases in Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay. Until about the 18th century, the British maintained peaceful relations with the Mughal Empire, whose authority and military power was just too strong to be challenged. Um, internal warfare from within the Mughal Empire weakened the economy and the country's trade. Um, it was because of these internal political and religious conflicts that the East India Company was able to gain control of India. Um, they soon transitioned from having a primary role of trading to having governance in India. Um, the British Raj was operated by remarkably few people. There was only 31,000 British in India in 1805, and it made up about 0.05% uh, of the population. Until the 1920s, um, the new elite was almost entirely British with British consumption patterns. This greatly reduced the demand for luxury products of India's traditional handicrafts. The damage to India's main industry was greatly reinforced in the 19th century by duty-free imports of British cotton textiles, which were much cheaper. The colonial government increased the irrigated area about eightfold in India. Eventually, more than a quarter of the, quarter of the land of British India was irrigated compared to 5% in Mughal Empire previously. Irrigation was extended both as a source of revenue and as a measure to migrate famines. It was first imported to Britain in the 16th century, composed of a mixture of linen or yarn. By 1750, cotton cloths were being produced, and the imports of raw cotton from areas such as the West Indies continued to grow. The impact of Britain's imperial trade links allowed cotton as a fabric to have dominant impact on culture, clothing, and style. By the 18th century, the middle classes were seeking a fabric, fabric which would meet their demands for durability, but also color, ease of washing, and cotton um, fitted all those requirements. It was during this surge in popularity that the East India Company continued to increase its imports of Calico, which is just a cheap cotton fabric from India. The British were competing with Indian markets for the sale of cotton. The value of, British, of the British Empire was enormous, and in order to maintain the edge on the competitors, the country invested in technology that would save time and allow for massive scale production. The British also developed many canals, roads, and railways across India. In fact, during the time of the British Raj, India developed the fourth largest rail network on the planet with the help of British engineering. This infrastructure benefited India in that it allowed the country better transportation networks that ultimately helped it transfer goods and people across the country. Furthermore, to prevent competition from the likes of India, Britain imposed protectionist measures in order to restrict imports whilst also forcing the Indian market open to British goods. The colonial rule of India helped to cement Britain's monopoly over the cotton producing market, contributing to the continually growing commercial success of the empire. Uh, one co um, company that we trace that benefited from the sale of cotton was of course the British East India Company. They were pretty much a catalyst for British imperialism in India. Um, they gained um, control 
over India, pretty much transitioning from a trading company to kind of an, a whole empire in India was in the Battle of Plassey in 1757. Um, after this, cotton sales back to Brit Britain and other colonies that they owned were skyrocketing, and this helped them dominate world trade. It is estimated that the worth of the company would be about $7.9 trillion in today's money. Topic 6.5. The project explains how Britain organized trade in such a way as to provide economic benefit to themselves at the expense of the colonized territory, India. Industrial Revolution. The economic importance of India to Britain is heavily related to the emergence of the Industrial Revolution in England. In fact, the factories in England that emerged during the Re Industrial Revolution came to play an important role in British imperialism in India. First, factories were being built in light of the Industrial Revolution and they needed resources to manufacture their goods. The British saw India as, as a source of raw materials such as cotton, sugar, tea, coffee, and wheat. And India was an expensive but vital resource in Britain's eyes to fill this need and fill this need and trade between them skyrocketed. Second, India proved to be an important market for goods manufactured in British factories. British goods began selling at greater quantities than Indian goods in the previous market due to their inexpensive cost. The British were able to, able to sell their goods, specifically textiles, in the colony for less money. Specialized workers became less specialized and the industry declined as a result. And Indian textiles became irrelevant in relation, in relation to British textiles. Britain went to great lengths to keep their textile monopoly, and they banned shints, a popular Indian textile, from being imported, imported into the mainland. Um, British imported goods began taking over the Indian markets in a frenzy, and it created further economic decline. As a result of the industrial trade exploitation, per capita GDP decreased in India while Britain skyrocketed. Based on the chart below, Britain's GDP increased 31% and India's decreased 2% between 1750 and 1850. India's change may be minuscule, but Britain's tremendous increase illustrates how they only benefited from their control of India. In 6.6, .6, the idea of an influence of migration to India is explored through different means. So for example, this is an oil painting of a British merchant sh ship traveling to India. So access to India um, began to influence exponentially as the British began their main control over the region. So this developed into a large trade relationship that eventually developed into the British desire to control India in its entirety. In Surat, uh, this was the first place where the British traveled into India. Um, they came by ship on August 24th, 1608. As they began to move themselves into this population, they began to see the possibilities of the trade relationships and advantages to large mass migration. They originally came because of their trade relationship and business, the East India Company. Britain's rapid expansion and their reasoning. So the map on the right holds the claimed and conquered territory of Great Britain during the year of 1870. This includes Canada, some parts of Africa, Australia, some parts of South America, and India. Um, the British really desired a monopoly over their trade and mass products. This was to create the most influence of economic importance um, and gain on their behalf of this trade relationship. They wished to unite India's kingdoms based on the white man's burden. Okay, so 6.7 is the aftermath when uh, British the Brit British have already invaded India, and Indian uprisings were kind of inevitable here, even though they were, you know, they, they suffered famine, they didn't have many things, um, but they did have good leaders. And uh, in one rebellion, uh, the massacre of Amritsar, 
Um, basically, the British had already started putting control over the Indians with something, a martial law. And basically, it prohibited uh, gatherings, anything that could possibly turn into an uprising. However, the Indians were not, they were unsettled by this because they had traditions. And one of those traditions was to go to the fair. And it was basically one of the things that uh, separated them from total um, subordinates to the British. But instead of getting away with this, when they gathered into the parks um, and protested, they were shot and several hundred of them died. Another rebellion was the Quit India movement. And basically in this picture, um, there was a peaceful protest, but it turned into several arrests. And um, although a very brilliant man, Gandhi, uh, told all of his followers, you know, um, keep it peaceful, maybe they'll listen to us, they did not. Instead, they did not appreciate the nonviolent protests, so they went ahead and made sure that their vo voices were silenced. So, um, along with rebellion, there was also um, an increase, actually, in trade between India and the UK. Um, around 1911 and uh, 1924, um, and even though there was a pandemic, which wiped out quite a bit of India's population, they continued to have their trade relationship with the UK for several years. Um, so even after, you know, famine and everything and their economy being taken over, um, they still prospered um, and were not poor because they all had jobs and they were all working for the British. One of the main causes of the British government's involvement in India after the British East Indian Company was the Sepoy Rebellion. It was a mutiny among the Bengal army to get rid of the influence established by the British East India Company, which resulted in the entire military basically revolting. It would end with them obviously being put down and the British government taking direct control of India since the company could obviously no longer. This would mark the beginning of a full cemented British Raj, which we see in the 20th century, and the main causes of the basically annexation of the area. And here we have our citations.